okay so good evening everyone moving on to the last session of today first we will take a very important topic of non operating room anesthesia as we all know these days anesthesiologists are called so much for their services outside the operating room like ct mri invasive radiology gi procedures various pulmonary procedures invasive coronary procedures which have its own problems new environment less availability of trained staff small working area etc etc so dr ashutosh jyoti jo joshi will uh, speak more about this and then we will we can have questions and discussion he is lead consultant in pain services and program director for pain medicine fellowship he is affiliated to department of anesthesia ku tech quart hospital singapore his area of interest are chronic pain regional anesthesia so i invite dr ashutosh joshi for his talk ashutosh you can start hello residents and esteemed faculty members hope you are having a joyous learning experience at the apic 2023 i am dr ashutosh and will be presenting today on non operating room anesthesia and here is the scope of this talk i'll talk about the general concerns associated with remote location anesthesia paying particular attention to the equipment environment patient and procedure related concerns subsequently i will go through the past year questions and will touch up on the recent guidelines in the later section let me start with this sre or what is known as serious reportable events which is published in a anesthesia newsletter a 75 year old 100 kg asa2 man was scheduled for ercp under monitor anesthesia care routine standard monitoring was initiated and he was sedated with midazolam 2 mg and fentanyl 50 mg iv he remained anxious and therefore he was given additional 2 mg midazolam and 150 mg fentanyl however he could not tolerate the insertion of the endoscope therefore the anesthetist decided to give him a bolus of propofol 20 mg followed by an infusion of 50 to 70 mg per kg per minute the procedure was begin however his oxygen saturations started to drop to 88 to 92% he was given 4 liters oxygen by nasal prongs however after 20 minutes his oxygen saturations decreased to 70% and the patient became severely bradycardic and was treated with atropine 1 mg attempts at back mass ventilation and placement of laryngeal mask care were failed the blood pressure was not attainable and the procedure was about it it took 2 to 3 minutes to push aside the heavy endoscopic equipment move in a gurney and turn the patient's spine to begin the cpr although the patient was resuscitated after 10 minutes of cpr he sustained severe anoxic brain damage and the life support was eventually discontinued i read this sre to you to drive the key message that the safety of the patient here is an overriding goal apart from patient safety and welfare the other aims of an anesthetist involved with remote location anesthesia is to minimize the physical discomfort and the pain of the patient control anxiety minimize psychological trauma and maximize the potential for amnesia we also control movement to allow safe completion of the procedure and lastly return the patient to a state in which the safe discharge from medical supervision is possible here is a list of common sites where we may be involved in providing monitored anesthesia care or general anesthesia away from the operating room sites these sites are gi suite where we are involved with ogd and ercp cardiac cath labs where we may be involved with pcis angioplasty tavi electrophysiology lab for ablation and pacemaker placement 
radiology lab, most commonly being MRI and CT guided procedures, obstetrics and labor for egg retrieval as well as labor analgesia, and in pediatric cases where we may be involved with lumbar puncture, bone marrow aspiration, and diagnostic radiology. If you look at the close claims update, most of the serious reportable events happen in the gastrointestinal suit, and that is probably because of the shared airway. The most common complications or SREs are death and aspiration pneumonitis due to respiratory events such as inadequate oxygenation and ventilation. Now, whenever you are asked a question about concerns related to remote location anesthesia, I would suggest that you use a framework such as E2P2, where E2 stands for equipment and environment related concerns and P2 stands for procedure and patient related concerns. The equipment related concerns can be remembered using a mnemonic soap me, where S stands for suction catheters and suction apparatus, O for oxygen sources as well as in spare oxygen cylinder, A stands for different types of airways such as supraglottic airways, endotracheal tubes and difficult airway trolley. P stands for pharmaceutical drugs such as epinephrine, atropine, naloxone, etc. to help us with emergencies. Standard monitoring should always be available. And E stands for special equipment such as defibrillators with pedals, gas scavenging system, extra safe electrical outlets, adequate lighting, as well as means of a reliable communication to the main theatre site. When we talk about environment, we must realize that we are physically distant from the operating rooms, we are physically distant from the pharmacy, and the help may not be easily available. We also have a limited access to the patient as the site is encroached sometimes by the nursing or the surgical colleagues. There is limited power supply, reduced lighting, limited storage for anesthesia equipments and supplies. There are specific sites such as MRI where special anesthetic preparation may be required. I would recommend you to go through these guidelines for the safe provision of anesthesia in MR suits, uh, which was published in Anesthesia Journal in 2019. I will just go through the salient points mentioned in this paper. All equipments which are used in the MR suit should either be MR safe or MR conditional. With MR safe, we means that these devices pose no MR related hazards to patients or staff when used according to instructions and can therefore be used in any MR setting. With MR conditional, we mean that these equipments pose no MR related hazard in a specified MR environment under specific conditions of use. For example, static field strength, rate of change of magnetic field. At any point of time, ferrous materials such as oxygen cylinders should not be bought into the MR suit. There are a number of incidents where serious morbidity and mortality has happened as the oxygen cylinder has been sucked into the MRI console. We also need to minimize the other risks associated with MRI, such as the ferromagnetic objects used. And therefore, a checklist is of utmost importance. The other concerns in the MRI would be providing adequate padding over the RF coils so as to prevent direct contact between the patient and coils. There are high noise levels in the scanner and therefore ear protection is desirable for all the patients. The monitoring equipment and the breathing circuits should have sufficient length by checking the planned range of movement of the MRI stretcher before leaving the scanning room and we should always meticulously secure the airway to ensure that it does not become dislodged. Telemetric monitoring is desirable as it reduces the risk of failing to notice the abnormalities. The other terms which are used in um, MR-related anesthesia is the fringe field and 5G boundary. Fringe field is the peripheral magnetic field outside the magnetic core. It is delineated as a safe boundary. This smaller field is usually described in gauze. 
no patient or staff member should pass the 5G boundary without undergoing an MRI safety check. Anesthesia should always be induced outside the 5G contour and adjacent to the scanner. In case of any emergency, the patient should be brought out of the, of the MR console, out of the 5G boundary and resuscitation started. The patient concerns are mainly related to the comorbidities and the medications which they may be on. The patients can come from a wide age range from pediatric to geriatric and have their own concerns. We should always check the fasting status, the consent should be checked and as I have mentioned previously, a careful metal check prior to MRI is a must. The procedures which are done in the remote location have a variable schedule, they have a rapid case turnover, they may be last minute scheduling with some emergency cases listed in. The setting of the procedure can be either at bedside, CT or MRI console. And these procedures nowadays are increasingly complex and invasive with rapidly changing technology. And therefore, it is advisable to communicate with your surgeon about the key steps involved in the procedure. The patient position here could be prone or lateral. The duration of the procedure can be erratic and sometimes there may be an abrupt end. To avoid overdosing the patients with anesthesia, it is always advisable to communicate with the surgeon so that the anesthetic depth could be titrated. And lastly, about the post-procedure care, availability of PAKU or ICU depending upon the patient and the procedure should be planned. I will now go through some of the common questions which have been asked recently in exams. This is a FRCA question where the candidate is asked to anesthetize a 75 year old male for urgent DC cardioversion in the coronary care unit. Um, he has a systolic blood pressure of 70 and a GCS score of 13 out of 15. We are asked to list the advantages and disadvantages of providing anesthesia in the CCU, i.e. remote location anesthesia. What factors must be taken into consideration when choosing an anesthetic technique for this patient? And what complications can occur as a consequence of the procedure? I will just read the examiner's report for you. It was only 50% pass rate for the candidates. The examiners were looking for these key points and the advantages they wanted the candidates to mention that we avoid the transfer of an unstable patient to the theater. The cardiology department skills are readily available. The specialty equipment and drugs are immediately available and it allows earlier treatment in the CCU. The disadvantages mainly are remote and unfamiliar environment. Also, I need to write about the lack of capnography, easy availability of anesthetic drugs, recovery and skill assistance. And sometimes the WHO checklist is bypassed in the remote location anesthesia because the procedurists are not aware about it. We also need to check about validity of the consent as the GCS is low. Look at the recent investigations, the starvation process and the status and the potential need for intra and intra-hospital transfers. We need to mention about both anesthetic as well as cardiological complications, namely arterial embolism, myocardial ischemia, pulmonary edema, burns to the patient, and electrical injury to staff. The next few slides are the answers which I have prepared, taking into consideration the examiner's report. I have provided the PDF of these slides to the EPIC team and they will be able to share it with you and you can read it at your own leisure time. So this slide talks about advantages and disadvantages of doing this procedure in the remote location, the considerations for anesthetic technique and the complications. The next question is providing the ECT uh, to a 55 year old patient for severe depression. They ask about what are the specific preoperative considerations for ECT, what are the physiological effects of ECT and which physical injuries may occur during the treatment. The patient is taking lithium and fluoxetine and what are the anesthetic implications of these agents during the ECT. Again, it was a, a very poor fail. 
An examiner report mentioned that many candidates did not realize that samithonia would be given and did not appreciate that myalgia is a common side effect. Many thought that ECT could not be conducted safely in an isolated environment. Consent and mental health issues, problems with patient communication and the likelihood of comorbidity did not feature in many scripts. Of concern was the failure to understand the significance of lithium or fluoxetine therapy as patients appearing on routine theater lists may be taking these drugs. Few candidates made mention of the potentiation of relaxants or volatile anesthetic agents by lithium. So here is uh, the answer which uh, I would probably write in the answer script. Uh, we have to mention about the capacity for consent process here. Uh, it is very difficult to obtain a full medical history. We have to assess uh, for, for the comorbidities uh, which affect the suitability of ECT. In particular, the contraindications for ECT such as significant ischemic heart disease, cardiac failure, significant valvular disease, raised intracranial or intraocular pressure, and untreated cerebral aneurysm. We should also check for the implantable cardioverter defibrillator and which should be deactivated. So always lies with your cardiac physiologists before starting the case. The physiological effects of ECT are mainly uh, laryngospasm, increased salivation. There is increased risk of aspiration as these patients are not incubated. And in the cardiovascular system, there is a brief parasympathetic response with bradycardia followed by increased heart rate and blood pressure and therefore all the necessary drugs should be available to manage these swings. There is increased cerebral oxygen consumption and intracranial pressure as well as increased intragastric pressure leading to high risk of reflux. The patients would also have myalgias both due to seizures as well as the use of saxamethonium. The physical injuries that may occur during ECT are dental damage due to seizure as well as bite blocks. There may be intraoral damage due to biting. There may be musculoskeletal damage and fractures, uh, but they are rare now since we use muscle relaxants. The myalgias are common due to the use of saxamethonium. Coming to the drugs, lithium potentiates the effects of the neuromuscular agents and the volatile agents. The patients may also have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and therefore consider their food status as well as electrolytes. It has narrow therapeutic index and ensure there is a recent level check. The drug is renally excreted. Um, if NSAIDs are used during the procedure, they may reduce lithium excretion and result in toxic levels. The significant side effect would be that of cardiac arrhythmias. The fluoxetine, which is another drug, is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And therefore, if the patient is given tramadol or meperidine, they may end up with serotonin toxicity or syndrome. The drug also inhibits the CYP2D6 enzyme. And therefore, uh, the metabolism of uh, codeine to morphine is prevented. As a result, the patient may not have any analgesic effect. Um, another question on ECT, uh, we have answered most of the questions, but I will just go through uh, some of the important points here, uh, which is the definition of the remote location anesthesia, the three main goals of the anesthetic technique specific to ECT, and um, the effect of phenylgene. So if you are asked to define uh, remote location anesthesia, it is defined as any location in which an anesthetist is required to provide general or regional anesthesia or sedation away from the main theater suit or anesthetic department. It cannot be guaranteed that the help of another anesthetist will be immediately available. This may be either within or away from the base hospital. Coming to the three main goals of anesthetic techniques specific to the ECT, we want to give drugs so that there is rapid onset and offset of consciousness with rapid recovery. There is effective attenuation of hyperdynamic response to the electrical stimulus. The muscle relaxation to prevent injury for the duration of electrical stimulus and subsequent seizure. And minimal suppression of seizure activity by the rest of the technique. The final gene is a MAO inhibitor which is non-selective and irreversible in nature. Administration of indirectly acting semethomimetic agents such as ephedrine or metalaminol should be avoided. 
as they may precipitate a severe hypertensive reaction. The next best choice to treat a drop in the blood pressure is phenylephrine, which is direct acting. Adrenaline and noradrenaline would be safe to use also. However, due to their potency, they would not be considered as the first line choice. In general, a cautious approach would be to discontinue MAO inhibitors before ECT if the medication has not been helpful. Risk benefit analysis should be discussed with the psychiatry team or on a case by case basis. The other common question asked is about the transfer of an intubated patient for an MRI scan. We have gone through most of the questions. However, I will um, just go through uh, precautions to prevent the burns. To prevent burns, there should be no breach in any insulating surface that might risk the metal touching skin. Fiber optic cables for ECG and pulse oximetry eliminates the use of electric currents, which may read induction currents and burns to the signifying underlying skin. Telemetric monitoring is advisable as it eliminates the risk of induction currents. The ECG leads should be of high impedance. Do not allow any cables or coils to cross over and use a foam insulating padding on patient's skin wherever you suspect the touch of the cables. The other serious risk associated uh, with uh, the scans is the use of contrast. Uh, and therefore, you should avoid gadolinium-based contrast agents if the patient has an EGFR of less than 30 mils per minute. Uh, do not repeat the contrast within the seven days. We should also avoid it in pregnancy unless absolutely necessary. Uh, be mindful of the anaphylactic reaction due to these agents and therefore drugs such as adrenaline should be readily available. Um, the contraindications are mainly uh, the presence of the ferrous material in the body which uh, can be easily found out if we routinely do the checklist. Here is another question on MRI. Uh, we have gone through most of it except um, describe the problem encountered following spontaneous or emergency shutdown of the magnetic field. Um, and what happens is known as helium quench, uh, as around 1000 liters of liquid helium is used to keep the superconductor cool. In the event of emergency shutdown of the magnetic field, the helium expands to a gas which is known as quenching and must be vented out of the scan room quickly to prevent a hypoxic environment for all personnel as well as patient. I will go through um, the concerns, especially the patient and the procedure related concerns for coiling in the patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. These patients are systemically unwell. They have profound cardiovascular instability during the induction of anesthesia. They have raised intracranial hypertension and cerebral vasospasm, and therefore control of arterial pressure and carbon dioxide tension are essential. We should obtain the pressure response to a tracheal intubation, as well as careful positioning is desirable to avoid any increase in the CVP, which will eventually lead to elevation in the ICP. I commonly use remifentanyl infusion from the start uh, so that the pressure response to intubation is obtained as well as extubation is smooth. Neuromuscular blockade is usually used with positive pressure ventilation to maintain a PaCO2 of 4.5 to 5 kilopascals. Transient hypotension and bradycardia or asystole may occur during cerebral angiography with contrast dye injection and therefore you should have fluids as well as drugs such as atropine readily available. The serious complications which can happen during this procedure is hemorrhage as the surgeon is using heparin and therefore reversal of anticoagulation with protamine should be readily available. Ischemia as a result of thromboembolism such as clot forming around the catheter tip can happen. Vasospasms, embolic material or hypoperfusion can lead to decreased GCS in the postoperative period and therefore high dependency or ICU bed should be available for these patients. Occasionally urgent, urgent craniotomy or EVD drainage of CSF may be required and therefore a backup emergency theater should be available prior to starting these cases. Lastly, I would recommend you to go through the guidelines which is published by American Society of Anesthesiologists and Royal College of Anesthetists UK recently. I will just give you 
the salient points in the tabular form. Both the guidelines talk about availability of oxygen source, suction source, scavenging system, monitoring drugs and resuscitation equipments, availability of electrical supply, light source availability, adequate source, emergency cart, and train assistance, as well as uh, post anesthesia care. I've been mentioning these points again and again, and you can cover all these points remembering the mnemonic E2P2, uh, where E2 stands for equipment and environment related concerns and P2 stands for patient and procedure related con concerns. The guidelines also talk about uh, building the safety standards by routine audits. That's all I have for you today. I uh, hope uh, you had a meaningful session today. If you have any questions, you can always email me at the email provided below. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashutosh. Hello. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Are there any questions? No questions, ma'am. Okay, Ashutosh, you have put in uh, this topic very beautifully. You have covered most of the things. And even I would say the demand for non-operating room anesthesia is increasing and it is definitely much more challenging. And what I would like to say with my experience is we should have proper SOPs for different procedures depending on our local conditions and what procedures are we doing. We should not take these casually. And uh, to add on the list, I would say we should have one contact number for helps if you are in trouble because you are away from the OT. Thank you, Ashutosh. Can we move on to the next speaker? Hello. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. So if there are no yes, questions, now Dr. Rupesh Yadav will speak on another important topic, positioning in anesthesia. He is a professor at Dr. RML Hospital, New Delhi. And his area of interest is transplant anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, and critical care anesthesia. So positioning is another very important topic which requires the contribution of anesthesiologists, surgeons, paramedical staff, everyone. And if we are not giving utmost care